Welcome back to the channel folks and to another painting tutorial, the subject of which is the classic German HQ objective and for those who don't have one of these old objectives but would like one for their own collection, how to make one of your own. Now you can see here side by side the original objective with the German figures in it, that's the one nearest the camera just now and the one I made for Americans because I had some extra American figures lying around and you can see it was possible with the inspiration of the original to make a very good representation of that for your own collection. So I hope this video gives you a bit of inspiration and some ideas on how to get some nice looking objectives for your collection. It's something great even just to present when you're showing your army to your fellow gamers or if you're going to an event. Before we get stuck into the video itself folks, it's worthwhile taking a few minutes to talk about objectives and what they're all about in the game. Now when I play, I normally just use an objective like that because you can set things on top of it or whatever, it doesn't interfere, it doesn't confuse. Sometimes an objective with a vehicle on it can actually make somebody think there's a vehicle on it. But that doesn't mean objectives have to be functional and dull. You can be creative and that's the thing that objectives are best suited for to my mind. You can work your way through your big projects. You'll see some of the projects that I've been completing over the last 12 months, especially if you follow the Facebook page. You know, there's huge amounts of vehicles, infantry, guns and so on. And however much you paint, your time is limited and you can find yourself you know, getting fatigued, getting weary, and you're losing your painting mojo. Objectives help you get the painting mojo back. It allows you to do something creative. Typically with odds and ends, extra stuff you've got lying around. And that's how all these were put together. The Shermans had three Shermans, for instance. I wasn't going to have them in a unit at the time. I didn't have an American army. So I thought, what am I going to do with them? I'm going to make some objectives. The Hellcat with the Infantry, German infantry running around, once again, extra stuff lying around. Here, odds and ends from various projects all left over. A tank, a little anti-tank gun and a couple of figures. And you get all these things and think to yourself, how can I add a bit of character to my armies and also just break the monotony of approaching all my painting in the same way? So I highly recommend you give some thought to doing objectives yourself, folks. It's a lot of fun and you can add a lot of character and personalisation to your armies. Now, at the end of the video, there's going to be an extensive set of stills uh, for these objective markers you see here, plus a few others. Most of my objective markers are no longer with me. I tend to give them as gifts to friends, people that I play with and such likes. This one here, for instance, is going to be given to one of my regular players soon. But I've got lots and lots of pictures and I will share them at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. Let's begin by taking a look at the materials that we're going to use to create our own HQ objective. We're going to be using a lot of milliput, some green stuff, quite a few cocktail sticks, and then for tools, quite simple, a little hobby knife and a pair of basic snippers. Nothing special needed in the way of model kit kind of snippers for this folks. This is rough work, so the simple snippers will do fine. And let's not forget a large base. Now this one is an old plastic one. It's quite good to be working on objectives with these old kind of bases because they are flat to begin with. There's no holes. If you did have one with holes, like the newer versions, you better to fill them in first and let that dry. So you've got a nice smooth surface to work on. You can also buy MDF versions of this kind of base and that would be suitable too. If, like me, you are using one of these old bases, score it lightly with your hobby knife. You want a, a bit of surface there for the milliput to grip into. The first step in creating the objective is going to be getting a solid covering of groundwork 
all over the base and you can see I'm just squeezing out a lump of milliput to an even layer across the entire surface probably talking about two to three mils thick but I wouldn't go any thicker than that folks I can't see any need for that when working with milliput to keep your hands and your project clean as you go use some tissue to just rub off what's on your fingers it works a treat but you need a proper clean of course when you're finished so I've got an even covering down over the entire base next up is to create this well-worn well-trodden area of the internal space and we're going to do that by using the end of a paintbrush any kind of rounded end of something will do fine here folks as long as it's the right kind of size and it's not going to lift off the milliput as we go so something smooth would probably work better for such a thin coating of milliput as you can see I'm just dabbing the end of the paintbrush into the milliput turning the base around in my hand sometimes even maybe just changing the angle that the end of the brush is being applied to to get a nice random all over surface now whilst this is still wet remember milliput will dry overnight so you've got a good couple of hours to work with it safely we're going to start creating some of the log wall I'm using the cocktail sticks for this because that's what I've got to hand but you might also want to consider for thicker logs to use bamboo skewers I'm using the original objective marker to calculate the lengths of cocktail stick that I will need folks just do something similar yourself based on the video you're seeing here place the sticks on cut them up as required and don't stress too much about exact sizes that's not what we're about here we're making something that looks rough and ready so the measurements can be too the bottom cocktail stick is going to get stuck into the milliput then I'm going to glue up from there I'm using super glue because you're going to need something that's going to make those cocktail sticks stay together you're stacking one on top of the other and you don't have time for it to stay balanced to dry with for instance white glue or wood glue I'm placing the uprights in support as I'm doing this too folks that will help us glue it in place because we can glue it to the bottom rung and to the upright piece I use a gel super glue for this kind of gluing as well folks because it's nice and thick you know so it will make sure that there is contact on these round objects are maybe only going to have very very small surface contact otherwise don't worry about the height of the uprights that we've glued in there just now folks we can cut them down to size once we've got all off the wall in place and keep all the little off cuts that you have been snipping off the ends of these cocktail sticks folks the shorter limbs may be usable in themselves but also the pointy ends they will be used specifically to the front of the wall as you'll see shortly the side wall goes in the same way folks but for the back I'm using a piece of plastic card or just simple card would do as this is going to be covered in earth and this is going to be a visible part of wall save us a little bit of time folks now we can start creating the entranceway starting by building up the outside edge of the wall just a bit more then it's on to the inside wall the shorter wall and we're going to glue that all together in the same way folks and we're also going to be adding an upright piece just to help keep it nice and steady whilst it's gluing and also to get the, the right look now you can see all of the log wall in place I'm now going to add just a bit of height to the corner of the objective marker where that bit of raised ground is and I'm going to be using some leftover milliput for this to create the tree stump I am going to be using a little bit of twig something that fell off a bush or a tree near to my house it's been drying for a very long time folks so it's nice and solid and dry it's not going to start coming to bits you don't want to be using wet little twigs for this and then just put it in place there's going to be another layer added to this this is just to get it nice and secure and then you can see me starting to cut down the uprights to size a little bit of trimming here to get everything looking as neat as we need it to be but remember it's not supposed to look too neat 
Now I'm going to be adding a couple of uprights to create the doorway to this entrance. The milliput is still wet folks, I've not left this at any point, I'm just working right the way through so that they can be pushed into the milliput in the same way as the uprights on the rest of the piece. And then creating the log roof off the entrance is really quite simple. Just cut them roughly to size, line them up, glue them in place and you'll be done there in no time. Now the next stage is bulking up the earth banks that cover the outside of the log wall. This is a very simple process so you should take care when you're handling it folks like me because I'm still working on the, the wet surface. You can leave this to dry to the following day before you start this process but you don't have to, you know, just crack on, have some fun. So when you're applying this, just push it in. Don't worry about the surface. We're going to be covering that. Just make sure it's the correct height so that you're showing the top log and the top of the upright supports. Our intention is to follow the plan set by the original. So you can see a bit of earth goes around the end of the wall here. So let's get a big lump of milliput in there. Now those pointed little off cuts, we can now push them into that milliput bank that we've created. I'm following the pattern of the original here, but you could put them in, in any combination that you want really folks. And then I'm cutting them down to size. And then onto the back, there's nothing too fancy here folks, it's just a, a lump of earth basically. And so we're just going to stick that on the back, push it into place and make sure it's on firmly and it's thick enough so that it'll provide enough bulk but it will also leave enough space for us to put the subsequent layer as you'll see of more fine earth on top. So one final thing before we set it aside to dry till the next day, I'm going to add just a little bit more bulk to the mound on the top right hand corner there beside the tree stump. But we can see here it's really starting to come together, starting to look nice. So a quick double check, tidy up if required and then we'll be ready for the fine groundwork. Now for that I'm going to be using this Vallejo project here, there's lots and lots of different kinds of these pastes. This one is quite wet, there are other drier ones, the colour isn't quite so important here because we're going to be painting it. So check out the range yourself, see what you think might be suitable for your own projects. Don't apply too much at one time folks here, place a little lump on and then start working it. Our intention here is to ensure that all of the milliput is covered but only enough of the logs are covered for us to get the final look that we're after. I'm not worried about getting any on the edge of the base here. It makes sense for it to go all the way down to ground level so to speak but if you want to keep that edge, maybe you want to paint it a different colour then be careful at this point and remember you can always wipe off the excess along the edge using your finger. Please note I'm not applying this paste to the surface that we created using the end of the paintbrush. This is for the earthen walls and for the mound of earth around the tree trunk. It's very easy to pick up some of this on your fingers as you're working folks. It's almost inevitable to pick up something off the edge of the base for instance as you're holding it. But if you do apply it somewhere you don't want it by accident, it just washes off. Just get an old brush, a little bit of water, wash it away and you'll tidy it up no bother at all. And that goes for working on groundwork like this or if you're even doing basing of figures and you get some on a figure by accident. Once you've got your first pass done, go around, do a double check, just make sure everything's nice and even and you've not left any exposed milliput on the earthen wall and then leave it to dry till the next day. Next up some green stuff work and we're keeping this really simple here folks. We're just cutting little lumps off green stuff from a rolled out length and then applying them down. Now you can go one stage further on this if you want and create little, little ruffles or little rolls to represent the tied end or the tied open end of the sandbag 
and that is visible on the original objective but I'm not going to do that here just to save myself a bit of time I think it's going to look good enough without it the choice is yours folks be conscious of scale as you're cutting these to size don't make them look too big and then you know once they're in place that's when you can start working them a bit more incidentally a little bit of water on the end of the tool or knife as I'm using here for the shaping will help because then it won't stick quite so much and you can start sort of pulling at the corners you know pushing at them getting that gravity look you know so they look heavy and sort of just pouring over the edge a little bit off the curve of the logs now I've put some jerry cans and boxes and such like together and the best way of attaching these is using the same basing material that we created the F texture with. Just set them down into place and this material will hold them really tight, you know, the lightweight pieces, you don't have to worry about them coming away. And then you can do just a little bit of tidy up around the edges to deal with any paste that has been squeezed out. And as you can see folks, we're now ready, once this is dried, for painting. Quite simple and straightforward. You don't need a lot of modelling skills to get something that's going to look really good and, you know, just really lift the level of your army presentation. I completed this over two sessions, so it's a nice little side project that isn't going to take you away too much from painting those big battalions that we're all faced with. But it's on to the painting next and I'm going to focus on the original resin piece for the painting process, but you would paint this up in the same way. Before we start painting, let's take a minute to look at today's subject. Now, you don't unbox many of these things these days, folks. You're not going to find many of them still in the blister like this in pristine condition. I've got one of these myself. This I am painting for a commission. I've got one sitting in a box somewhere that's already undercoated. Like a lot of the stuff you might find on the internet, you know, like on eBay or such likes. But well worth tracking them down if you don't want to make one of these yourself or if you would prefer having the original because they are great pieces very well sculpted as you can see and it's in one piece as you can see as well so you can very quickly move on to the painting great old collector's pieces and if you don't have one of these old pieces you will have to populate the base so to speak by finding a few figures spare from your own stash i personally have bucket loads and don't forget folks you might too because the old command teams the old observer teams and staff teams they could be perfect for this purpose so folks on to painting and the first step is going to be undercoats or base colors you want to get this coat down in a minimum of two to three layers don't overwork it or try to get it all done in one pass folks the colour I'm using for the ground is one that I typically use in, in most circumstances and that is Panzer Ace's German Tank Crew Highlight. Now German Tank Crew is black but this you can see is a nice earthy brown. That's maybe a wee help to you folks when you're highlighting your German Tank Crew as well. If you use this colour it will highlight it without making it much brighter in the way that a grey would. The logs I'm giving a coat of US Field Drab. Now painting tree stumps can be a bit challenging because you've got to figure out what colours you're actually going to use here because it's not the same colour as a cut log. It's not brown. It's a sort of greyish green brown kind of combination so if you're using those kind of colours you can't go too far wrong. So I'm starting off with a coat of green grey. I'm giving the sandbags a coat of olive drab. That's the dark US olive drab. It might be called olive brown now. 
but that provides a nice dark shade colour for the subsequent layering process that I'll follow. Right folks, we are ready to start adding a bit of depth and a bit of highlight to all the various surfaces here. So I'm going to start with a wash on the logs. There are so many different browns you can choose to apply this wash with. I'm going to keep down the acrylic route on this project rather than the enamel route. And here I'm going to use flat earth. Nothing fancy required here folks, just get it washed all over. It doesn't have to be even. Being uneven will actually help the finished results to a degree. And just make sure you're a bit darker in all the recessed areas. Once the first coat of wash is applied, you can see here I'm just putting a few dots of dark colour, little spots here and there just to help make the surface look a bit more natural, a bit more uneven. I'm giving the tree stump a wash of a much darker brown. In this case I'm using German Camel Black Brown, but I'm trying to preserve that grey undercoat. Next up for the logs is a careful dry brush. You can use the original colour, the US Field Drab, or you could use something brighter such as Old Wood. But don't go heavy here folks, we're not looking for a heavily dry brush surface, we're just looking for the beginning of a bit of a highlight process. I'm going to spend a bit of time on the sandbags, I'm going to layer them. By that I mean I'm going to have my shade colour, a main colour and a highlight colour. And I'm going to start the process just by picking out the corners, the shape of each individual bag. I'm using medium grey for this. It's a colour that suggests the sort of plain fabric that sandbags are made of but that's been weathered down so it's not too saturated. And here you can see me starting to layer up the main colour. Now this is a light colour over a dark background so in most cases you will need to put more than one coat on, in this case you most definitely will. Now when you put in the second coat on it is worthwhile leaving some of the semi-opaque paint there as part of the shade so there's a transition but you don't have to worry about that too much folks the most important thing is not to leave too much shade when you are following the shape and the sculpt of each of the sandbags your first layer will generally map out the shape that you're after and the second layer will define it and ultimately control how much shade you are going to leave and we're going to follow that up with a glaze of the medium grey. Got to be very careful here folks when you're applying this because it's not a wash. You do not want the paint to be sitting in the recesses. You want it evenly spread over the entire surface in a way that just softens down the shaded areas. That way the difference between the darker light isn't too strong. Once the glaze is dry I will go back and do a quick tidy up. This is just very quick folks, just to help firm up the final shape before I move on to the highlight. The colour I'm going to use for the highlight is deck tan. Now that's a very bright colour against the darker surface of the objective and in particular of the sandbag, so we're going to be using it in very small amounts. As you can see I'm using just the thinnest of lines and the thinnest of highlights here folks. I'm picking out corners, I'm picking out the bunches you know, where the, the necks of the sandbags have been tied up. I'm picking out high points on the folds and on just, the, the, just to accentuate the way the sandbags are sitting. And a bright highlight such as this really just brings everything into focus and that is our intention folks. Adding a bit of focus, a bit of depth a bit of definition. We don't want to go heavy on this at all because it's not supposed to be the dominant colour, just the focusing colour. And I'm going to use some of that deck tan just for a very careful highlight, sort of edge highlighting, so to speak, using the edge of the brush on the tree stump. The heartwood on the stump I have painted with old wood and then a few 
very careful once again highlights of Iraqi sand just to accentuate the shape. I'm also going to use that Iraqi sand just for a few spot highlights on the logs. I'm going to hit some corners, some cut ends to help bring them into focus and also just a few dots here and there on the logs, a few short thin lines once again to help lift them out of the background of the objective. Once again folks, don't overdo this, it's really just a little accent to the finished look. An interesting objective marker is got lots of little bits and pieces lying around equipment and such like you know to give it a bit of character and a bit of detail and this one's certainly no exception. We've got an ammunition box, a random mine lying around folks that's a wee bit dangerous health and safety come on hands get it sorted and a few other things so the the metallic or German grey type objects I'm starting with a coat of black then a coat of German grey and a highlight of London Grey once again to just lift them out of the background to give them a bit of focus. The jerry can I am painting with a shade colour of old wood then layer it up through Dunkel Gelb to a highlight of German Camel Beige World War II. The big oil drum I gave a coat of German Grey as a shade colour and then I layered up Luftwaffe uniform on top of that so when I'm saying layering folks remember just like with the sandbags I'm leaving a little bit of shade colour in the recessed areas in this case around the various rims on the drum and then for a highlight colour very small amounts of London grey or a similar light grey colour will do but once again keep the highlight small and carefully applied so it's just an accent. An interesting bit of detail you can paint to these old drums is a bit of rust on the large rims and ridges that go around the circumference you know these were designed to be rolled around to ease the movement so the paint would get worn off on these high points so a, a little bit of a dark rust colour here will work really nice you don't have to overdo it folks a nice simple dark rust colour will paint the picture we need without getting too let, let's get getting too excited about painting rust on things folks that's not what we're trying to do here I'll just show the highlights getting painted on here folks just so you can see how it just lifts everything up out of the background with a very small amount of the right bright paint. I'm going to finish off now with some pigment powder. You've noticed I've not done any dry brushing on the ground at all. That's something you can do folks, you know, if, if that's your preferred approach it's perfectly valid but I like to go for a more gritty and earthy look to create a bit more depth highlight and such like by using a wash of pigment powder. Now you'll notice I'm applying the pigment wet to the piece. I've used a palette to prepare it so that I've got it in the right condition before it goes on to the figure. I'm not applying it dry and then working it. As you're applying the pigment it can be hard to determine what the finished look is going to be so don't overdo it, do not add more and more and more because maybe you think I can't see anything because once it's dried it becomes much much more visible so let it dry and then see if you need to just wash some off carefully with a brush or add some more. Now I used a dark earth pigment for the trodden area which I am going to assume is going to be very muddy. For the earthen banks and for the area around the stump I'm going to use a light pigment and that will also help just define these areas and give the objective a bit more shape. After this folks it's all about adding the figures and then any appropriate level of ground cover you know grass and tufts and such likes. And that'll be us for this tutorial folks I hope you enjoyed it found it useful and maybe give you some ideas or inspiration for tackling some objectives of your own. Next up we're going to be getting a big long slideshow. I mean I, I went through my uh, archive shall we say of pictures and I do have quite a lot of pictures of objective markers that I'm going to share with you next so 
stay tuned and enjoy that folks there's lots to see and in the meantime i'll just say thanks for watching and as usual thanks to all the subscribers out there who follow the channel and to you guys who just drop in from time to time to see what we're doing if you'd like to support and help the channel grow you could always subscribe and hit the bell button which means i'll definitely see you all on the next one